Hello and welcome back guys. Today we're going to take a look at the Surge build guide again, but this time in depth. So we're talking about gems, engravings again, we're talking about cards, we're talking about rotations, and we're talking about like everything that I can really think of when I'm playing Surge Blade. At the end of the video I have a full section of actually soloing Egrexion, which is a tier 3 guardian, using this build and using everything that I'm talking about here. So, And without further ado, let's get started. So before we talk about the actual surge engraving, I just wanted to uh, quickly mention stats and, uh, you know, combat stats, secondary stats, and what you should prioritize here and why you should prioritize it. So right now, as you can see, I have 362 crit and 1161 specialization. Now crit is obvious, I mean, crit chance is important, especially if you have a big hitting ability like surge, but specialization is a little bit more confusing to people. So let's look at this. First of all, this increases the surge skill damage, which is obviously very important. On top of that, the blade art meter recovery through attacks is increased, which means you generate more meter the more specialization you have. Which uh, on surge blade isn't that useful in itself, but it has its uses still. On top of that, you also get more skill cooldown reduction and more awakening skill damage while you have more specialization. Especially the skill cooldown reduction here is super important because it allows high cooldown abilities, like for example Moonlight Sonic, like for example Soul Absorber, to be up way more often. So specialization is your most important stat, and crit is your second most important stat. On top of that though, there's one thing that is also quite important, and is which accessories you actually pick for this. So what I do is getting a necklace with crit and spec, and every other accessory is specialization. Now why do I do this? It's actually quite simple, because of the pet buff. You could obviously run a little bit more crit, but that will mitigate a little bit of the pet buff benefit. And what do I, what do I mean by that? So if you go to your pet inventory, you can see two different stats. One is a defensive one, which is irrelevant here, and one is the specialization one. This 10% specialization actually applies directly to your equipped attributes. What does that mean? That means if I unequip this, or if I dismiss this pet now, as you can see, currently I'm at 1161 specialization. I lose 10% of that. So the more of that stat that you have, the more your pet actually buffs the stat. And that's why you always want to have the maximum amount of spec possible. Uh, obviously, some crit would be nice, but we'll get into that in a second. So now for people that are very new to Blade, if you activate your identity once, well, let's, let's, let's use an ability first, it will give you the cooldown reduction and it also gives you a buff depending on how many balls you have now the thresholds are very specific once you filled out one ball you will get the first threshold once you fill out entirely fill out the second one you get the second threshold and in this case i filled it out completely and i get death trance level three so this one gives me movement speed, attack speed, and attack power. This is very important as this buffs everything of your class, not only your search buff. And now if I activate this again, it obviously it does a big slash and it's also a back attack. So keep that in mind. That will be important later on. Okay, let's talk about the surge engraving first. So basically how this works is when you activate your identity buff once, with the death trance we just talked about, you can then start stacking a buff that stacks up until 20 and also has an internal cooldown of 0.4 seconds. That's important to note because if you're using too many abilities at the same time or you're having too many hits at the same time, it will not stack faster. It will only stack once every 0.4 seconds. So over stacking abilities will actually get rid of some of the stacks that are possible. Now, now that I have 14 stacks, I activate it again and that will now have buffed my surge as you can see in the buff window here, for each stack, this increases the damage of that second activation of your buff by 7.5%. Now, that being said, the entirety of Surge is kind of based around using all three death orbs, or all three death trance orbs of your identity to stack this as far as possible. There's a lot of tricks to this and, you know, a couple of things that you should keep in mind, but that's the general gist of the idea of Surge Blade. Basically stacking a lot of uh, hits while you're waiting to get up until 20 and then reactivating it for a huge chunk of damage, right? 
Now, a lot of people are confused if you should even go further than level one on this. Level one surge is fine. If you have more, like if you have higher priority engravings, then level one surge can be used. Overall, I would still consider getting three level three though. I think it's actually really, really good because this actually gives you an attack power buff. Now I'm at level three surge. So let's see what that looks like. So now it says in the buff window, outgoing damage of Deathblade surge is the same, but you get 1% attack power per stack and that applies to everything by the way not only to your surge so so you're basically buffing your entire class and one more quick mention just so you know because a lot of people also get confused by uh, me recovering my balls really quickly depending on how many stacks you have you also recover your identity back up and that's why i said earlier the identity meter gain for this uh, you know setup isn't as important so for example i have 20 stacks right now if i reactivate it i will get all of those stacks back and have full three death orbs again with a death trance or a level three as well because it was fully stacked up right so with that being said there's a lot of strategy in optimizing this and there's a lot of different approaches. Some people say you have to stack it up until 14 stacks. Some other people say you have to max it out. My recommendation is as long as you can get at least 14 stacks, you're doing pretty well. But getting to 20 stacks is the optimal approach. If you, Unless you have all th three balls fully filled up, you don't get the level three surge buff, which is 10% attack power and 5% bonus attack speed. Obviously though, bosses move a lot. Bo bosses have mechanics that make them immune to damage. Bosses just, you know, do things that you don't really expect sometimes. So for consistency's sake, as long as you have more than 14 stacks, that's a, not a bad idea to reactivate it. But if you can get 20 stacks, that is the optimal approach, at least in my book. On top of that, this is a back attack. So your spin cutter, vulnerability, open weakness, uh, synergy, and overall back attack amplifiers are very good on this build. We, t we will talk more, a little bit more about the stacks in the rotation part of this video, so stay tuned. So now that we have the identity and the engraving out of the way, let's talk about abilities real quick. And this is also ties into tripods and runes. So we'll talk about all of that now. As you can see, my ability setup is quite different than most meta surge blade builds because uh, I think this is better, honestly. <laughs> I think this is better. I was theory crafting this for a while and uh, yeah, here we are. There's obviously some changes you can do and I will mention those very quickly as well. Okay, let's start off with Polestar. You have two different options here, weak point detection or orb control in the first row and the other two, uh, well, you can't change actually. So you go Vital Point in Moonstar. This ability is nice because it's very easy to use, doesn't have very high cooldown. And if you do opt into Orb Control and you feel like you need more Orb Generation, this is also a very decent tool to do that on. Especially if you, you know, put a Wealth Rune on top of it. I don't have that at the moment. I think on Polestar you could almost play any rune, honestly. Polestar applies three stacks if you do it properly, which is nice. As I said, relatively low cooldown and, uh, you know, nice ability overall. Has good stagger, is also a back attack and has tier one immunity. So you don't get interrupted in that a lot. Now, there's a very quick uh, note of a replacement ability if you don't run Polestar or if you need a counter because I would get rid of Polestar if I do need a counter. So I would get on Earth Cleaver, this is a counter. On top of that, this is also pretty good stagger level and has destruction on it, so keep that in mind. On some fights like Valton, you will need this uh, all the time. On most fights, since you're a back attack class, countering isn't as imperative to your success on the class. So oftentimes I don't even use a counter, but if you do need one, take Earth Cleaver instead of Polestar and take it with this setup, or if you need more stagger, take Concussion level one as well. Now, next up, I wanna talk about Death Sentence because it's also an ability that a lot of people would replace. In my case, I play with Excellent Mobility, Cold Zone and Critical Blow, which uh, obviously in the first row, you can always also go opt into more destruction if you need some. Now, Death Sentence is, is very, very nice simply because it has good mobility, decent damage, relatively low cooldown on a, an 18 second cooldown here, and it also applies a lot of stacks with the cold zone. So as you can see right now, this stacks up until level five or five stacks, which is a lot of stacks for basically no effort. I also played the bleed rune on it because bleed is reapplied with each tick of the cold zone. So you can have a very long bleed duration. On top of that, a quick mention to explosion. If you want to generate another stack, 
I would recommend Explosion as well, because this applies one more stack in the beginning. But the problem with this is that Cold Zone only applies on the second hit, meaning you will have a little bit longer of a delay before the Cold Zone applies. But technically, you can generate six stacks with Explosion. Also, you lose a little bit of mobility. But later on, Critical Blow also scales slightly better with Tripod Effects. So I think Critical Blow is easier to use, gives you more mobility, and uh, is easier to apply Cold Zone with. But Explosion is also really good. They're both great, honestly. So as I said, you can replace this as well. And in a lot of meta builds, you would replace Death Sentence with Wind Cut. Most of the time with Quick Preparation, Sustain Enhancement, and Thick Sword Energy. Although Sword Energy Explosion gives you one more stack, this one is way easier to use. But I hate this ability. I think it does no damage, although the cooldown is low. Um, I'm not a fan. You would also play Bleed Rune on this one, by the way. Next up, let's talk about Spin Cutter really quick. Uh, this is a very obvious choice. You can play this on 4 points, you can play this on 7 points, you can even play this on 10 points. Generally speaking, I play it on 7 or 4, because Open Weakness is the most important part of this ability. Gives every ability, or gives everyone a 3% damage bonus in your party to that target that you applied it on, and frontal and back attacks do 9% bonus damage as well, which is really good for back attack classes like yourself as a Deathblade, right? On top of that, you can get quick preps just so it's up more often. It's also used as mobility, so, you know, it's nice to have. Eventually, you would want to go into triple spin, but uh, right now, with the amount of skill points we have, that's probably not going to be an option for a while. And let's talk about the second mobility, uh, you know, ability of Blade. This one is... Honestly, mandatory. It's so important. It's so good. Swift fingers, tenacity, high axle. It just allows you to, you know, move around, get back, get behind the boss. You know, when the boss is frontal attacking you, you can basically use axle to get behind the boss. So, for example, in this case, that let's say the boss is attacking me here, you use axle and you can reposition yourself behind the boss with no problem and can you be, again opt into back attacking. Right. Every ability in this build, besides Maelstrom and uh, and Moonlight Sonic, are back attacks. So repositioning yourself while also having a tier 2 super armor on it is a fantastic tool to just have a smoother experience uh, with Deathblade. Speaking of Maelstrom, it's also a mandatory ability in all builds. If you played Orb Control and Dark Order, you don't really have other choices here. Orb Control is insane because it actually generates more Death Orb meter, depending, like, all of your abilities generate more Death Orb meter while you have this active, which is insane. And Dark Order is an attack speed and movement speed buff for your entire party, which is also insane. So, always pick this, at least on 7 points. Actually, going any more than 7 points is pretty unnecessary in PvE, so just play it on 7 points. <laughs> on Spin Cutter, you play Rage, because, you know, it's a very, your most, your lowest cooldown ability, and having Rage up more often is quite nice. We talk about attack speed a little bit later, though, because attack speed on Surge Blade is not necessarily always a good thing. So Dark Axel, I would either play with Quick Recharge or with Gale Wind for the bonus skill cast speed. Both are fine, I think. Honestly, I think Gale Wind is slightly better, but uh, it doesn't really matter in the long run. And on Maelstrom, I'm currently running Wealth. There's just one reason for this. I'll get into this in the rotation section. You could also play Bleed on this. There's a lot of different, you know, ways to play Maelstrom again and which rune you play on it. I currently have Wealth just for a little bit more identity meter gain. I'll talk about that in the rotation section again. Let's talk about Moonlight Sonic real quick because there's one important thing to note about this. You obviously know about this ability already. And uh, let's talk about the rune, actually. A lot of people play wealth on this. You could even play something defensive like a protection rune on this. Generally speaking, you don't want attack speed, though. And uh, yeah, here's why. Right now, with this setup, if I use my Moonlight Sonic and try to build stacks with it, I get three stacks of Surge Enhancement. Now, I put Gale Wind on Moonlight Sonic and see what happens. Now it only generates two stacks instead of three. So and that's why I said earlier, attack speed isn't always a good thing on Deathblade abilities because you do want to not overdo the amount of hits that you do as, uh, you know, all, most of the time you want to generate stacks rather than get the ability out quickly. So in that sense, 
Gale Wind is not an option on Moonlight Sonic. Normally, the people play Wealth on it, though, because there's not really a lot of better options for it. Now, for Solo Absorber, we'll just talk about the first section real quick. Again, if you need high stagger level, Concussion is a good choice. This ability also actually has Destruction on it already, so it's also quite nice and has Paralysis Immunity in PvE, so Tier 1 Immunity, so you don't get interrupted in it a lot. You have Swift Fingers, Fist of Darkness, and Half in, in most cases. This ability also you play with Gale Wind actually this time because, uh, well, it doesn't really matter. You will always get the two hit stack out no matter how fast this basically is. But uh, Soul Absorber is great because it also applies, it gives you a lot of identity meter even without you know, a Wealth Rune or anything. So I think Soul Absorber is honestly mandatory because it has so much utility, it does good damage, destruction, stagger, and on top of that generates a lot of meter. And last but not least in my build is Void Strike. This ability is also very, very important as it has Swift Fingers, Void Zone, and Dark Dimension. It doesn't, it, attack speed doesn't really affect this too much, but this setup is mandatory and that's why I also say you shouldn't really play Supercharge on this build because you only have one charge ability actually. This is not a charge ability anymore. This counts as a hold ability. So that being said, Void Strike is very useful as it generates the most stacks out of any ability in this, in this setup at least. So if you, if you use it here, you can see that I already got a lot of stacks just from charging it up. And the Void Zone applies even more stacks. So I have 7 stacks of Surge just from that. So on this I play Gale Wind at the moment. Uh, we will see how much more attack speed I'm getting from Dark Order and so on. But I think Gale Wind is pretty good here. Quick note though, you can cancel this ability early in this setup. So if you, if you don't want to get hit or if you just feel like you're not safe in this position, you can cancel it early and it will still generate a lot of stacks. So before we talk about engravings and everything else with, uh, with card sets and whatever, let's quickly talk talk about my rotation and why I do what I do. So right now I'm standing at a comfortable 1161 specialization. Now the rotation will change depending on how much spec you have because it will be easier to generate meter in the beginning but uh, let's just keep this in mind for now. Also a quick mention to awakening potions. If you are lazy <laughs> or if you're dying and you have to get your identity meter back up, Awakening Potions instantly recover the entire identity meter. So for safety measures and you think like maybe I'll die in this fight in this Guardian Raid and if you have to respawn, then an Awakening Potion is quite nice. Or if you instantly want to start with a full meter, you can also use this. A very useful potion, especially for Surge build or Blade in general. So now let's, let's, let, let me show you real quick what my current starting rotation is. Because this will, as I said, change depending on your stats. So you start off with Maelstrom just to generate more meter. One Spin Cutter is already enough. And then you go into Soul Absorber into Ultimate. And then you activate the identity before the ultimate actually ends, before the awakening ends. Now, why do you do this? This death trans buff actually amplifies the damage of your awakening already. So I'll just do it quickly one more time. You do Maelstrom, you do Spin Cutter, and you do one Soul Absorber half into ultimate, which gets you instantly to the third stage and allows you to activate it before the last ticks, the last damage ticks of your awakening are coming through, because this death trans buff will already buff your awakening damage because uh, you know you have the buff up before the last hits actually apply. So if you're struggling with this combo actually giving you all three orbs, I would suggest putting a wealth rune onto Maelstrom because you don't really have the choice to put it on Soul Absorber or Spin Cutter. So in this case, I would just go ahead and put it here. Maelstrom, Spin Cutter once is enough and to Soul Absorber into Ultimate, activating it back again for the maximum damage output. Also keep in mind that your Spin Cutter vulnerability gives a plus 3% damage received buff as well, or debuff in this case, which also applies to your Awakening. So you want to have that up beforehand, although it's not a back attack, it will still get a 3% damage increase. Okay, so the most optimal way to actually use your Awakening if you don't need it for Identity Meter is with 20 Surge Charges, level 3 Surge, and Spin Cutter vulnerability up, which is like this. This is the most damage you can do with your Awakening, and uh, you don't always have to use it just for Identity Meter gain. Only the real, the first three abilities are super important. You just have to keep note of when Spin Cutter is up and when it's not up, basically. 
and you just want to keep stacking because bosses normally don't stand still like this guy so uh, the, the rotation changes all the time but uh, also a quick mention before before i leave this here if you have that sentence up and you're charging sword art at the same time you're losing a lot of stacks because they don't they do too much damage at the same time too many ticks at the same time if i had used them separately this one would give me five stacks this one would give me seven which is 12 but right now i only got eight so as i said always keep in mind on surge that you do too many hits at the same time you will get rid of some of the stack generation that you have okay now i'll show you a quick rotation just how i would do it so let's get rid of this real quick so we start at zero and here here we go so we do maelstrom spin cutter one is fine soul absorber twice awakening reactivate it for the identity come back with dark axle then you do a void strike into a pulse star maybe another spin cutter to reapply the damage buff now the boss is slowly taking down death sentence to reapply a bleed and on top of that get stacks passively then maybe a moonlight sonic to back it off and now we get a spin cutter again just for the bonus amplification before we surge once again 6.3 million right there and now all my identities back up and we start over again we you activate it again you do maelstrom you apply a spin cutter you do a soul absorber maybe you apply a death sentence maybe you have to run away for a little bit just get some passive stacks oh the boss is attacking me i'm canceling void strike early so i get the void zone up anyways and this is just a very easy way to generate stacks maybe you put a pole star in real quick maybe the boss is staggered again spin cutter and reapplied again but as i said depending on how many stacks you have and what abilities you have up you can also reapply the identity at 14 stacks at 15 stacks it's all fine as long as you know you feel comfortable a lot of bosses have invincibility frames and all of that so sometimes you have to use your identity uh, the second time a little bit earlier just to get the damage out before the boss is running away or something okay so you have to be a little bit flexible the rotation will change depending on the fight depending on the situation generally speaking if you have more than 14 stacks, reapplying the identity is fine. If you want to perfectly play it and you want to have the smoothest experience possible, reapplying or doing the second hit of the identity at 20 stacks is optimal just because you get the full full stack of identity back up right and on top of that if you play higher levels of surge you also get way more attack power the more stacks you have so you want to use the second hit you know at 20 stacks preferably okay let's talk about engravings real quick i'll just probably put up a very quick like priority list um so for me first of all we will have surge level three i think level one surge is fine as well Adrenaline is probably the most important second engraving. You can also run this on level three. If you want, if you don't have enough like points left, having adrenaline level three, surge level one is also fine. On top of that, after that, I would definitely opt into Master of Ambush. This is basically just a flat 25% damage increase to back attacks. Obviously, this is conditional, so not in all cases will this apply, and obviously two of your abilities aren't even back attacks either, including your awakening. But this is a very, very nice and easy engraving to get because uh, there's no negative effects. So even if you have this on level 1, level 2 doesn't really matter, it still gives you a flat bonus damage amount. So Master of Ambush is my third most important one. After that, once we get there, which will take a while by the way, um, once you have three maxed out engravings, Surge, Adrenaline, and Master of Ambush, I would try to get into Grudge. Now Grudge, same with Keen Blunt Weapon, same with Cursed Doll. Don't play Grudge before it's level 3. Don't play level 1 Grudge. Don't play level 2 Grudge. If you play Grudge, it has to be level 3. So for example, if you can max out three engravings and one is level 1, I would probably go Surge level 3, Adrenaline level 3, Master of Ambush level 1, and Grudge level 3. Never play Grudge before it's level 3. Same goes for Curse Doll, and same goes for Keen Blunt Weapon. Yeah, that being said, after Grudge, I would go Curse Doll as my fifth maxed out engraving. And I mean, it will take a long time until we get to this point, but it's just to still keep it in mind, right now, Grudge and Curse Doll aren't really that useful because you're not gonna have five maxed out engravings, right? But keep it in mind, these are still good engravings, especially if they're level three, or well, only if they're level three, actually. I just want to give a one quick honorable mention to side focus. Now, this is basically a macro engraving, which uh, when you type in exclamation mark, exclamation mark, exclamation mark five times, 
then you get a well damage buff to the next ability this doesn't really apply as much or as well to awakenings so this is mainly used on on blade for the surge engraving so you have a bigger hit of that surge up until 28 percent which is massive by the way the problem with this is that it only buffs the surge and nothing else so you know if you can't hit your surge consistently especially in very late game content this becomes a little bit wacky you know but overall this is also a good engraving if you like you know really big hits i'll probably play this at some point as well uh, maybe even instead of cursed doll or something we'll see but uh, it's this is a fun engraving a quick mention for surge blade that uh, you can use as well one quick intersection here what about supercharge a lot of people keep asking me should we should we run supercharge on surge build should we not is it good is it bad and the short answer is you could play either but uh, let's just think about this for a second okay so first of all in my build that i obviously showed you before i only play one supercharge ability which is soul absorber so in that sense i don't really need to run supercharge but there's a couple other builds that i do run supercharge with surge and let's let's just let's just go over that very quickly so in void strike to actually make use of supercharge you will have to play play swift fingers void zone and then dark explosion instead of dark dimension Dark Dimension, though, gives you more stacks and is cancelable early, so you can get the Void Zone earlier. So now, as you can see with Dark Dimension, I have a lot of hits and I can cancel it early and the Void Zone still applies. Now, let's do the same thing with Dark Explosion, and you will see very quickly that that's not the case. So we charge it up. First of all, I can cancel it early, and it gives way less stacks, because obviously the first few hits don't apply. So that being said, I think Dark Dimension is way better. And if you play Dark Dimension, it doesn't get the supercharge benefit anymore. On top of that, if we think about Sur Surge Blade in general, Surge is a, well, our Surge Identity second activation does a lot of damage, almost the most damage in our entire kit, right? So you running supercharge does not buff your Surge damage at all. It only buffs the charge abilities, right? And the charge abilities in a supercharge build are Blitz Rush, Void Strike, and Soul Absorber. So in my case, I only have one charge ability and the buff doesn't apply to my Surge. So I don't think Supercharge is that great on Surge. It's very good on remaining energy, but on Surge, I would recommend not playing it, at least not late game. Early game, it's fine, but late game, I think Supercharge is pretty overrated, honestly. Also, just a quick mention for the skills again, because people are confused with the tier 3 tripods that you should take and shouldn't. It's very easy, actually. You just go to your tripods that you're using, hover over them, and you can see the next level of it. Generally speaking, you literally just get tripods effects of the abilities that you're using, of the tripods you're using. Like, there's no deeper meaning behind that. Although, for example, if you go to a death sentence, critical blow actually scales better than explosion, for example. So that's also something to keep in mind. Now let's talk about gems really quick, although I think gems are also very straightforward. So you have 11 gem slots and you have 8 abilities plus your surge ability that you can gem into. This would, this would total out at around 17 gems, so keep in mind that you know you can't have 17 gems, you can have 11, so you have to make some choices. For surge blade, the choice is very easy because the most important one is the surge skill. So having a surge gem at least at some decent level is nice to have and uh, you know the most important gem in our kit. You would want damage increase gems on all of your abilities besides spin cutter, dark axle and maelstrom. So you would want damage on death sentence, damage on pole star, damage on moonlight sonic, damage on soul absorber and damage on void strike. So that would be technically be five gems plus the surge skill gem so you have six damage gems at all times, technically speaking. Obviously, as I said, early on, the gems aren't that important. Just keep a surge skill up. The rest doesn't really matter that much. You will be fine clearing all the content. But if you want a min-max, you would want damage increase on, you know, five of your abilities plus the surge skill. On top of that, I would put a cooldown reduction gem on Dark Axle and a Maelstrom. Uh, on Maelstrom as well, just for the cooldown reduction, and the rest you just fill out with cooldown reduction gems for your other abilities. But as I said, the highest priority here is the Surge skill, and after that you can work on, you know, getting a little bit more damage on your other abilities. Okay, let me quickly also show you the card sets that I'm working on. There's, uh, well, a couple different options, but I'll show you the ones that I'm opting into. The obvious one in the early game is Lost Wind Cliff. 
once you get to 12 piece awakening of this it gives you a 7% crit rate which is obviously really really nice for 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 blade as we don't really have that much crit i'm not going to really tell you how to acquire all of these cards because that will take like 20 minutes <laughs> but i'll just tell you which sets i should i would recommend so early on getting a 12 piece awakening and lost wind cliff for the seven percent crit rate on top of your adrenaline gives you a nice and cozy amount of crit that is very useful for surge now if you go a little bit more end game a little bit more late game into this i'm currently working on Forest of Giants, which is a three-piece set, which is very good defensively and also gives you a little bit more recovery from your potions, plus the three-piece set of three Umar families, which gives you up to 12% back attack bonus damage, which is obviously in our setup, a lot of our abilities to back attacks, very nice to have. And the trade-off is just that you lose a little bit of damage, you lose the crit percent, but you also get a lot of defensive stuff on top of it. And the very end game setup, that people are working on already is Light of Salvation, which gives you up to like 15% bonus damage flat out, plus dark damage reduction, which is really good against endgame legion bosses or legion raids. A lot of them do dark damage, although that will probably change somewhat soon. Also, depending on what boss you're fighting, converting your damage into holy damage and increasing that holy damage by 15% is also very good because a lot of endgame bosses are vulnerable to uh, to light damage so this is an, an, another damage increase basically uh, just a quick bonus mention fate of the lazaniths is also a set that's used sometimes in combination with a back attack set although i think a two set feels kind of wrong so i'm not really <laughs> bothered by it but this is also an option and that is basically all i wanted to share today I will obviously update some things here and there depending on how many more skill points we're getting and like how the content is progressing. I also wanted to mention set effects, but since set effects don't really matter until we get to Argos, I, I wasn't really sure when to include it. Once we get to set effects, we'll pr I'll probably have uh, you know some more info in the description below about which one to pick. Generally speaking on Argos, you will probably pick the solar set for the crit chance, but we'll get into that at a, at a later point or something. But yeah, that is basically everything. That is the in-depth version of the previous guide and um, everything that I'm basically looking at and thinking about while I'm playing. Maybe I will have a little, uh, you know, Guardian Raid solo run at the end of this. So after, after my little outro here. So thanks for watching, guys. I hope this video was helpful. If it was, please consider subscribing. Always helps me out a lot. Thanks for watching, guys. And until next time, peace.